Morning, everybody. Honored to be able to stand before you today and, and speak to you out of the Word of God. Um, it's an honor to be able to start off the new year um, in this way. So, uh, yeah, we're going to be in Romans chapter 2 today. We're going to just be picking up where Pastor Brian left off a few weeks ago. Um, and just a few weeks ago, just two weeks ago, Pastor Brian finished out the first chapter of Romans. And we saw that already in the first chapter, Paul's, Paul's kind of hitting us hard, isn't he? Um, Paul talked about in the first chapter about what happens when God gives up, right? What happens whenever we refuse to worship God, whenever we refuse to follow him, whenever we get so set in our ways, we, we get so caught up in our sin that God gives up. Paul illustrates in those verses how just a little bit of sin can take root and it can grow. And he tells us how something as seemingly insignificant as unthankfulness can lead to things that are much worse, like idolatry and promiscuity, greed, and he says even murder. We learn that sin is not something to be taken lightly. Sin should never be treated as if it's no big deal. We often like to pretend that there are some sins that just aren't as bad as others. But that's not how God sees it. All sin is sin in the eyes of God. And even the smallest amount of sin can grow into something much worse if it isn't dealt with. And the really scary part is that if we choose to pursue that sin, it is God who will deliver us over to it. It is God who will deliver a person over to that sin that they're chasing. When that person becomes so set in his or her ways, God will sort of take a step back and say, okay, if that's what you want, I'll let you do that. We'll see how it works out for you. But why would God do that? I think we often ask ourselves, why doesn't God just take away sin? Why doesn't he just get rid of sin? I mean, God has the authority to do that. He has the power to do that, to just wipe sin off the face of the earth if he wanted to. Because we serve a God who is just. And that wouldn't be justice, would it? Because sin has consequences. There should be a punishment for sin. That's just justice. And we are all born with a natural predisposition to sin, right? We, are all, we all sin because we are sinners by nature. However, God gives us an option to choose not to pursue that sin, rather to follow him instead. He lets us choose that. He gives us that option. And for those that do not choose to follow him, God delivers them over to their sin. Right Now, this is part of the reason why I'm not a huge believer in like retribution theology. Um, that's the idea that God will, will punish us for sin here on earth. You know, he'll, he'll send bad circumstances. He'll, he'll put someone in, in bad situations in order to sort of punish them for sin, right? Whether that be the loss of a loved one or the loss of a job or something like that. There are people who believe that God does, that, does those things to punish us for sin. But I would argue that sin in and of itself is punishment, Right? God doesn't need to punish us for sin because sin is the punishment. Whenever we sin, that has natural consequences, right? When we do something that is sinful, it will lead to bad things in our life. That's not God's fault, that's our fault, right? So that's why I believe that God will just deliver us over to sin. He's letting us learn the hard way, I think is how how I like to think about it, right? You know, some people just need to learn the hard way. They can't be told that they shouldn't do something. They just, they have to learn it for themselves by facing the consequences of their actions. So while God does not punish people for sin here on earth, he will absolutely allow them to use their free will to disobey him. And he will allow them to face the consequences of that disobedience. Now that's that's a really tough pill to swallow, I think. However, 
chapter 2 is where I feel this truth really starts to sting. Let's read the first four verses of chapter 2 here. Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thy that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? All right, now before I get too far ahead of myself, I think there's some important context that we have to understand here, all right? So Paul spends the first three chapters of Romans basically trying to create a level playing field for all of humanity. He's trying to set all of humanity on the same level, right? And that level is sinful. He's trying to show that all people are sinful. All people have fallen short of the glory of God. And in chapter 1, he focuses on the guilt of the Gentiles, that is, non-Jews. And this should probably be obvious, right? I mean, the, the, the Gentiles were not the chosen of people of God. Naturally, they're not going to necessarily worship God, right? That should be obvious. Um, they weren't chosen, God's chosen people, so of course they will be found guilty in his sight. In chapter 2, however, Paul turns to address the hypocritical judge. Okay, that's our first point here. He turns to address the hypocritical judge. And now I believe he's specifically addressing the Jewish audience here. As he immediately after this, he begins to discuss the Jews' relationship to the law and what the purpose of the law is. So this likely would have been very shocking for the Jewish reader. They're reading chapter 1 thinking, yeah, of course those Gentiles are guilty. They're sinful. They deserve God's wrath. They deserve punishment. Right? That's probably how the Jew would have read chapter 1, the, the typical Jew. But then Paul turns it around on them. Paul sort of hands them a mirror in chapter 2 and makes them examine themselves. He tells the Jew, you think you have any room to judge the Gentiles? If so, you do the same things. Are you not also judging yourself? If you're going to judge someone for doing something that you also do, you judge yourself in that process. And you can open up your Bible pretty much anywhere in the Old Testament and find examples of the Jews doing the exact things that Paul was accusing the Gentiles of in chapter 1. Idolatry, promiscuity, all of these things that, that Paul describes in chapter 1. You could just about drop your Bible open anywhere in the Old Testament and see an example of the Israelites doing that exact thing. We so often fail to recognize the sin in our own lives, right? Even when we point out the exact same sin in someone else. One commentator I read had this to say. He says, the implication in the opening verse is that a Jewish auditor heartily endorsing the verdict rendered concerning the Gentiles fails to realize his own plight. True judgment rests on the ability to discern the facts in a given case if one is able to see the sin and hopelessness of the Gentiles, one should logically be able to see oneself as being in the same predicament. But it is possible to be so taken up with the faults of others that one does not consider one's own faults. Now, while Paul is specifically addressing the Jew here, we have to stop and think, how often do we fall into this same trap? How often do you and I get so caught up in the faults of others that we fail to recognize our own faults? So while this, yes, while I believe that Paul is specifically addressing the Jew, I think that this really applies to all of us. How often do we pass judgment on the actions of others without stopping to examine our own hearts, without stopping to examine our own actions? Actions. 
You see, it's far too easy for us, as, even as believers, to read chapter 1 and think, oh, that doesn't apply to us. All right, it's all about how they weren't thankful. They became fools. They were delivered over to their evil desires. It's far too easy for us to read chapter 1 and develop this them versus us mentality. But in doing so, we run the risk of also becoming hypocrites. We run the risk of becoming the hypocritical judge when we take that attitude. As I'm sure most of you have probably realized, this passage strongly echoes Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus says, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Now, the important thing here to recognize is that neither of these passages are just blanket statements. They're not blanket statements condemning all forms of judgment, right? It's not as if they're, they're just broad prohibitions of judgment, period. That's not exactly what it's saying. Scripture does not tell us not to judge at all. It tells us that if we do judge, we should do it with a right heart. We should examine ourselves first so that we can judge righteously, rather than judging hypocritically. But what does it even mean to judge righteously? Well, before we get into that, I think it's important that we understand the manner in which God judges. Which conveniently, Paul talks about in the very next few verses, in verses 5 through 11. So let's read this, Romans 2, 5 through 11. But after thy hardness and impotent heart, Treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. Now here, Paul juxtaposes mankind with God. He's, he's talked about the hypocritical judge, that is mankind. Now he's going to move on to talk about the righteous judge, who is God. And the first thing to point out here is the impartiality, impartiality of God's judgment. God repays each man according to his deeds. There is no partiality with God. There are a lot of people who think that maybe merely being a Jew will, will gain you some kind of leniency with God, right? As if Merely being a Jew is enough to save you. Now, it's kind of a controversial topic. I'm not going to get too much into covenant theology and all that stuff. I'm, I'll let Pastor Brian take care of that as he gets further on in Romans. But who you are, who your parents were, who your grandparents were, that doesn't really matter in God's sight. right? Just because your parents are Christian and you grew up in church, that isn't enough to save you. Because there, no there is no partiality with, Christ, with God, right? God judges us all the same. And that's exactly the argument that Paul's trying to lay out. He's trying to lay out the fact that all of humanity is on equal footing in the sight of the Lord. No one has any advantage over another. This is because God simply does not play favorites. Sin is sin, no matter who you are. Now, at first glance, there's something a bit confusing about these verses, I think. Paul says God will render to every man according to his deeds. He will repay each person according to their works. To those that do, God, that do good, 
God will grant them eternal life. To those who practice unrighteousness, tribulation, and wrath, Paul, it, it sounds like you're saying that salvation is based on our works. It sounds like you're suggesting that in order to escape wrath and inherit eternal life, we just have to be good. We have to be good enough. It sounds like Paul is suggesting that salvation is based on works. I thought salvation was received by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, not by works. That's exactly what Paul argues in the book of Romans and in Galatians and in several other places. Paul argues that exact thing. He says that over and over again, that salvation is based on faith, not by works. So what, is, is Paul just blatantly contradicting himself here in Romans chapter 2? No, of course not. And there, I think, are there really two plausible explanations for this. Firstly, it could simply be that Paul is giving a hypothetical, right? He could be saying that all have fallen short of the glory, but it could be that Paul's telling us, um, or excuse me, all have fallen short of the glory of God, but Paul tells us that in the very next chapter, but it could be, it could be said like this. It could be that Paul's trying to say that like, no one is capable of doing what is good. No one is capable of what it takes, uh, of doing what it takes to earn their way to heaven. But hypothetically, if a person could do that, God would grant that person eternal life. Right? So it could be just a, a hypothetical, a theoretical question that, that Paul is asking here. Now, I personally find this to be a bit unsatisfactory. It kind of just feels like, uh, I don't know, like, not the best reasoning, in my opinion. Um, he's, he uses this kind of reasoning, these hypothetical questions a lot, but it's usually a lot more clear than that when Paul uses them. So I think the second option might be a bit more likely. I think it's meant to just be assumed that Paul here is referring to the born-again believer. Right? While good deeds will never save anyone on their own, Scripture does tell us very clearly that good deeds are the evidence, the product of salvation, that salvation produces good works. And I think that Paul is just assuming here in Romans chapter 2 that that's, that's who he's talking about, that the one who is saved, their works will show that, and they will inherit eternal life by that, right? The saved person will seek um, glory and honor. The saved person will continue in well-doing. Paul is by no means trying to suggest that an unregenerate person could somehow earn salvation through good works. Rather, he's speaking to the fact that the born-again Christian has received a new nature, and therefore they will produce good works. And I think that's really the only reasonable way to understand this, given the context of the surrounding passages, right? Because like I said, the first three chapters, he's talking about how all have fallen short. No one can earn their way. So I think in chapter 2, we just have to assume that he's talking about the regenerate Christian. And it's because of this new nature that Christians are able to seek after what is good. It's because of this new nature that we're able to receive eternal life. And so this still fits perfectly within Paul's argument. That's exactly what what Paul begins to argue in the very next verse, in fact, in verse 12. And so God, being the perfect righteous judge that he is, must punish sin. He cannot just overlook sin and pretend it doesn't happen. There must be consequences, and the consequence is death. God is the only one with the authority to make that judgment. And so that's the way in which God judges. He judges righteously. He judges without partiality. And the biggest way that his judgment differs from the way that we might judge is that his judgment is final and it's eternal, right? God has the authority to, to save someone. He has the authority to forgive someone. He has the authority to condemn someone. We don't have that authority. That's, that's not the way that we make judgments, right? Right? 
we are only able to make judgments based on what God has already told us is right and wrong. Right? We aren't deciding whether someone will go to heaven or hell. No, we are only called to judge in a manner that benefits those around us. As I said, Matthew 7 isn't a prohibition against all judgment. It's only a prohibition of hypocritical judgment. Rather, what Jesus is trying to say is that when you judge, you should do it in a manner that lifts, those, that lifts up those around you. You should pass judgment in a way that helps those around you. And this probably sounds really weird in our current society, right? Because we as a society, I think, have kind of redefined judgment. Nowadays in America, judgment just means disagreeing with someone, right? If, if they have a particular worldview and you don't necessarily agree with that worldview 100%, you're, you're somehow passing judgment on them. That's what our, our, our world thinks nowadays. But that's not a biblical definition of judgment. No, biblically, we can judge in a right manner. We can judge in a manner that helps people, right? Not in a manner that, that where we're trying to lift ourselves above them, not in a manner where we're trying to make ourselves look better than them, Rather, when we judge, we should recognize our own sin. We should stop and examine our own hearts. We should stop and think, am I doing the same thing that this person is doing? And I think many times we will realize, yes, I am. I do the same thing that this person is doing. Now let's see if we can get through that together, right? This, this kind of carries along with the Galatians 6 idea of, of bearing one another's burdens, we in this room, we all have very similar burdens. We have similar things that we struggle with, right? And so we should be building each other up, trying to get through those things together, trying to help each other overcome those obstacles in our lives, overcome those sins that we struggle with. That's the manner that God has called us to judge in. So we judge ourselves before we judge others. That's the key here. We must put the love of Christ on display for them, right? But first, we must confront our own sin. Otherwise, we judge hypocritically, and in turn, we, we also condemn ourselves. Now, to conclude today's message, I want to talk about what really differentiates these two people that we've been talking about, the hypocritical judge versus the righteous judge. What differentiates a person that judges rightly and a person that judges hypocritically? And I think that the main thing is the way in which they respond to God's goodness. That's what really differentiates between them. Because there are two, there are only two responses to God's goodness that Paul lays out here. Let's read again verses 8 and 9. He says, But unto them that are contentious... And do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. So the first response that Paul lays out here is contention. That's the first response to God's goodness, is contention. It's as if this person is fighting with God. They're against God. Right? They're combating God. And this kind of response can only come from a place of pride. They might think that they're smarter than God. They might think that they don't need God. Heck, they might even think that they're somehow more moral than God. There are people in this world like that. They respond to God with contention because they think they don't need him. They think they don't need God. And that kind of response can only come from a place of pride. I mean, how prideful do you have to be to be contentious towards God? And so obviously, if that's how they feel towards God, then they're not going to see others. They're not going to, they're not going to see, they're, they're only going to see themselves as being better than others, right? I mean, if they're that prideful towards God, how much more prideful will they be to those around them? That kind of person cannot judge a person, another person, fairly. Right? They will always be quick to 
to point out the flaws in someone else, but they'll never willingly admit their own flaws because they're just too stuck in their own pride. Now let me flip this around on you because I think that even a Christian, quote-unquote Christian, can fall into this trap. I think a a true born-again Christian will almost always avoid this. But there are a lot of people who will claim to be Christians. They'll call themselves Christians, but we know that one day at the day of judgment, God will say, depart from me, for I never knew you. And so this person claims to worship God, but in practice, they're only really worshiping themselves. They've just, made an, they've just made an idol that looks like themselves. That's what they call God. It's just themselves. And so if you don't conform to their false idol, their false idea of who God is, then if you don't look like them, then you're not good enough. Right? And they judge hypocritically because they have an inaccurate view of who God is. Let's not respond to God's goodness with contention. Instead, let us respond with repentance. That's the second response to God's goodness, and that's the appropriate response to God's goodness. Right? That's what Paul says in verse 4. He says, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. The goodness of God should lead you to repentance. That's really the only logical conclusion, right? God, in his perfect righteous judgment, would be completely justified in condemning every one of us right here and now. He would be perfectly justified in pouring out his wrath on the whole world on account of sin. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. God, in his goodness, saw fit to present us with a way out, a way out of condemnation. He gave us this incredible gift so that we might escape his wrath and rather be forgiven of our sins. That is a good thing. That is the ultimate display of God's goodness. And the only reasonable way to respond to that is with repentance, right? Because if he's going to forgive you of your sins, then you should try to avoid those sins, right? Paul will later say, shall we keep on sinning so that grace may abound? By no means. Forgiveness should not be an excuse to sin. Rather, it should be all the more reason to run away from sin, to avoid sin. So God has given us this incredible gift that through the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection from the dead, we can receive forgiveness of sins if only we would repent and believe in him. All we must do is confess that he is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead. And Paul tells us that we shall be saved. Shall, that's a promise. I know I'm getting a little ahead of, ahead of myself. Pastor Brian's going to talk about this in a few weeks. But God says that we shall be saved. And if God promises something, who could ever take that away from us? So I want to conclude this message with a challenge. I want to challenge everyone in this room, myself included, to take a step back to stop and examine yourself today. Take a step back and ask yourself, how have I responded to God's goodness? Have I been contentious? Have I fought against God and judged others hypocritically? Have I acknowledged my sin and turned away from it? Because it's then and only then that we can see others the way that God sees them. Broken sinners in need of a Savior. Only then can we confront them about their sin in love so that they might also come to a place of repentance. Will you pray with me today? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to come and to 
read your word. And I thank you for this opportunity to um, deliver this message that you've given me today. Lord, I pray that everything that was said today was not from my lips, but from yours, Lord. I pray that each of us here would be able to just examine our hearts today, that we would be able to take a step back and we would be able to see ourselves for who we truly are. That we wouldn't be prideful and we wouldn't be contentious, but rather we would recognize our brokenness and that we would be able to use that to help those around us, that we could bear one another's burdens. We could help uplift one another so that we might all be able to grow closer to each other and ultimately grow closer to you, Lord. 